is that urban planning is the sort of big picture, the, the policies, the guidelines, and then urban design is the implementation of those uh, policies and guideline, guidelines. That isn't to say that urban planning has to come first. It can also go kanang backwards. Now you start off with a small space, which will be integrated into the uh, planning policies. So it's just really kanang what scale are you working on? In urban planning, you're working on uh, city level uh, policy making, and you really can't go into the details of the buildings. You're just really defining where are the streets, where are the road right of ways, what is the use of that land. In urban design, you're going into the details of how wide should the street be, how wide should the sidewalks, the carriageways, where if there on if there are gonna be any street trees, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then of course architecture you're designing the building. And then in interior design, it's like you're designing the spaces inside the building. So if you think about it that way, urban planning is kind of like like uh, architecture, and then Urban design is kind of like interior design. So like different scales, but just as detailed. <clears throat> okay. So quick history and theory. So urban design has been around since uh, cities were around. I think the oldest, the oldest cities were Catalhuyuk uh, in the ne uh, Neolithic re uh, Neolithic Revolution. So if you've, you've seen this in artist class, I'll just like, uh, post up some images so you remember. So these were the or kind of, um, the ancient cities, like prehistorical cities. Um, they still technically technically fall under urban design, but it wasn't like formal urban design. So if you can see here, uh, settlements were very kind of close together. There are there doesn't seem to be any clear like streets, but if you see these other images, like this. You can see that um, the uh, scientists estimated or like guessed that people were living on their like roof, like for like I don't know, <laughs> like Magrilaf said that they can also dry some goods there. They also started kanang farming, and then basically this is like um, the idea is that the community or the city planning or the urban design was very tight to keep everyone sort of protected from like. Um, what do you call this? Uh, outdoor elements. Uh, basically, in these areas, sometimes it would be very kind of hot during the day. So you see, don't they don't have a lot of windows at night? It's cooler. So this kind of layout uh, helps them. And then they have their kind of um, what do you call this? Uh, they have their animals. They are like uh, sheep. They're um, uh, whatever. What do you call this? Uh, animals they were like uh, raising just nearby the village. So this isn't formal urban design yet, but technically it's still part of it. So the first really kind of urban design was uh, done during the Roman period, um, at least kind of documented at, uh, urban design. Um, and these were documented by Vitruvius in his book De Architectura. So if you, the 10 books of architecture, if you remember your archist, and then from there, it was developed even further, like through the medieval ages and then the Renaissance. So you have people like um, uh, Leon Bartista Alberti, uh, Filarete, and what they call this? Um, I think just Filarete. I think there was also another one here. I can't remember. But yeah, so Renaissance architects developed it further. And then they ended up with this kind of uh, city planning um, concept, where uh, since Rome was an empire and then they wanted to spread out their uh, kingdom, they preferred, like if possible, a circular type. This was <clears throat> this was the plan for an ideal city called uh, Sfrosinda. And then <clears throat> the Romans and the eventually the on Renaissance architects and planners thought that a circle would be the most ideal shape. And then at the center of the circle, you would locate your uh, town square with your capital and your uh, government buildings and maybe some schools and churches. 
So some examples of this is like the, um, let me see, I'll just put it up here. Like this, are the uh, ideal Renaissance cities. <clears throat> you have some cities that look like this. Also small, let's look for a bigger image like that. So the idea was that a circle is better because you don't have the, it's easier to defend apparently because you can have fortifications on all sides versus a square where it's like you have some corners that are a bit more difficult to defend. But yeah, the idea of a circle is just, mm, came out as uh, both a form and like idea on form and function. Because a circle, you can they could apply like these like fortifications here. These um, I forgot what these were called, but uh, there's a name for this. But just focus on the form side, the circle, and then that town squares and uh, what they call this. Uh, the government centers and schools were located in the center, so very kind of centralized sort of planning. And then. We also adopted something similar by the time uh, the Philippines was colonized under Spain, where you have the um, ideal plaza or like the uh, design guidelines of the laws of the Indies, where we also had a central plaza where you would find the church and the uh, government building. So an example for this would be the Intramuros. So Intramuros. I didn't have any slides prepared. I was feeling a bit <laughs> uh, sick this morning. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, I'll just go to like maps. It's a lot better. So one thing you will immediately notice is they have the same sort of uh, fortifications at the corners or around the site. So if I turn it off like that, you can see some remnants over here. I'll just like bring out my snipping tool like that. So you can see there's like this here. I really forgot the name, I can't remember it. But the function for these like defenses is that um, you would put, uh, I think around 1600s, they would have cannons already and then you have like archers. But the story behind it is that because of the shape of this like diamond shape here, how you would sort of uh, enter the fort, you'd be forced to run uh, in this direction here. And then away from the uh, cannons or the archers who are firing from you over here, like that. So that's why it's diagonal. So the edges here makes like a, a good sort of location for archers or cannons to like aim at invading forces. And then by the time they get to the wall over here, they would be sandwiched between two archers or two cannoneers. So they really, on, uh, it's a really kind of strong defense. So if you go back to the circular plan here, something similar is also happening where you would have invaders trying to cross, for example, this bridge here, and then the archers and the cannoneers would be looking like this. So everywhere like that, like that. So that's why it's shaped the way it is so basically invading forces will be well forced to gather at this point they want to get over the uh, bridge and then also you see the moat there so that's even another sort of a obstacle for invading forces to get to and then you see here the bridge sometimes they would have a bridge because there's a moat also defended by uh, whatever these are called i can't remember I'll just Google it later, but that's the idea behind it. And you see it being done in Intramuros over here. And of course, you can never get a perfect circle in actual real life. So they had to uh, modify their ideal plan to fit the terrain. And this was also part of uh, early uh, urban planning and design. 
And then one thing that I really want to point out that uh, what we learned from the ancient Romans is the grid pattern. So if you see your intramuros has a grid pattern over here. And the reason why that was uh, applied in several ancient cities all the way up to the 1600s, and I think even until today, is that grid patterns are more equi uh, equitably distributed because you can easily subdivide land if you just have a square versus um, something like this, like our sort of sprawling type dead end development. And then in even, even in the ideal city over here, it still follows a grid but it's a radial grid because it's a circular city. Okay, moving on. So many tabs, sorry. And then in the 1800s, uh, Camillo site, my resource for Koan, um, Urban Design Principles, uh, wrote a book called City Planning According to Artistic Principles, also known as The Art of Building Cities. So because from because we learned that uh ancient romans and renaissance architects favored uh symmetry symmetrical layouts um camillo site said that it doesn't have to be symmetrical to be kind of uh beautiful or functional so he suggested a incremental approach to city planning which necessitated irregular irregularity in urban form so basically, he went against the grain and said that you can still have beautiful cities and functioning cities, even if they're not uh, built with symmetrical streets. So here are his illustrations over here. Let me open this in new tab here. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm -hmm. Like so. So you can see this is uh, different plazas in different places uh, in Rome and I think Florence as well. And what he did was documented uh, what he believed as like artistic or beautiful urban um, spaces in different places uh, across uh, Rome. So you see here, uh, Piazza Peraca is like here. I'll just like snip it so you can follow like this. So the shaded portion are the buildings and the unshaded portion are the streets. And if you can see what is the common uh, element or like the common, um, the commonality between these different layouts is that there's always a continuous line of buildings. Here, even though it's irregular, it's continuous. So what do I mean by that? Like, um, Let's go to a section of Manila, for example. Let's say Kenny, or I think it's better if we see it like this. So you have a street here. I'll just make another snip. Like so. But the, the, the strip, the buildings, the street is here. Like that but the buildings aren't consistent so i'll color it in blue you have one set of buildings here one set of buildings here and then you have an empty space and then you have buildings again so here is like buildings empty space building empty space so i'll highlight the empty space or the lacking spaces in green uh, where's my mouse ah, there it is so Empty space here in green, empty space here in green. And this is basically underutilized lots in uh, most of the world. In the Philippines, I think it's also the same case. If you go down here, you have big vacant lot in the middle of a kind of uh, almost filled in street. So these gaps are not just wasted space, but also uh, not really good to look at, so it's not visually appealing. It's also not kind of aesthetically pleasing, um, and it's also not kind of functional. So, what uh, Camilio site highlights as kind of artistically or kind of aesthetically pleasing is that these uh, Roman cities always have a continuous 
sense of enclosure. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, um, urban design principles on it. and then how do we go on, uh, recreate or use this idea of enclosure. But anyway, just to show you an example, if you go to a Roman city, which for the most part has remained intact, uh, let's say Italy. Oh no, let's go to Florence. Florence is better. If you go to a typical street in Florence, you have that sense of enclosure. So notice when I switch on uh, the Google Maps over here. Oh, let me turn off the label. So I think this is a good enough scale. You don't have those gaps or unused lots. And then where you do have gaps is usually a significant structure. So I'll highlight the buildings in red. So the buildings are continuous here, continuous buildings, continuous buildings. Notice there are no gaps. Or if there are gaps, they're like along uh, building edges, like this. And then this is continuing here, continuing here, continuing here. And then you have an important public space I'll highlight in green over here. So very different from, I'll just open a Manila again, for example, or Cebu City even. Maps, like so. Like this. So you can see there are empty spaces here, here, and here, where my mouse is. Kita raba. Just want to confirm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So basically, that's the idea. The the edges of the street are devi defined by the kanang architecture or the buildings, and then this would create, if you just look at it, more kanang functional meaning there is no unused space and also a better sense of kanang aesthetics or ba basically visually pleasing streets and public way uh, public uh, spaces so something like this is what we call good urban design or an example of good ur urban design and then something like this is uh, it's not terrible but it's getting there let's just not say our urban design is terrible so we have mango avenue so what are the things that immediately jump out? Look at the proportion of the street to the building heights. So like this, if you have a, if let's say the road is one unit here, I'll just call it unit here. So what, let's say the road is one, and then the buildings are about, just like mata mata lang, looks about two units. So this is a one unit, one unit, one unit. So the ratio of the street width to the building height is one is to two. And this makes the space, uh, according to uh, Camillo site and like uh, contemporary urban designers as well, this makes the space feel more enclosed, but not in a bad way. It's enclosed in the sense that it provides security and safety. So how does this provide security and safety? is because um, you have uh, open uh, window to the storefronts on the ground floor, meaning they can see the people on the streets. And then you have people above the windows can, can um, also monitor what's going on on the street. So the people walking here are not sort of hidden. And then all, all the activities can be observed from the buildings uh, basically from the out from the inside of the buildings looking outside onto the street so there's what we call passive surveillance so we'll talk more about this as we go along however if you look at um, for example this mango avenue here it's still a bit gone it's still safe but it's not as kind of well technically it's not super safe <laughs> bro the problems are very apparent so we we'll take again we take the ratio of the street width and the building heights. So let's say, um, I think it's about one, two, three uh, street width to like building height of one. So in our 
most like American and like um, like cities that will that were built around 1900s. They look like this. So the street is uh, three units wide, and then the buildings are only one unit tall. So it's a lot wider, and really that's so to accommodate the private vehicles. <clears throat> but what is the impact of this? Here, the street or the passageway is no longer uh, used by people, but cars, like people in cars. So number one, the danger here is you can't like uh, use this space if you're walking. So you're pushed to the sidewalk here. Still okay. But um, what happens when there are no more cars, like late in the middle of the night or kind of mga kadlaon, and then these stores are closed. So there are no, there's very few residential spaces here. So there's no one watching these canning streets. So there are no eyes on the public domain. And then it's okay during daytime, but at nighttime, like especially if there are no more people, it becomes very kanang unwelcoming compared to this setup here where the stores may close, but the above spaces are residential areas. So there's still people watching over these streets. So something like that. That's how sort of uh, ancient sort of cities or kanang, I think cities up until the 1600s uh, provided sort of public safety and security, whereas cities that were built in the 1900s onwards, basically together with the invention of a car, are less desirable, but it's it's really kind of it's not the worst. We can still like fix it. Okay. So this is where uh, the 1900s we had the shift in urban design and planning with the invention of the automobile. So it really made um, public spaces smaller uh, in the sense that people really can um, use the vehicles more than. Uh, non-motorized transportation and we have a uh, public space that looks like this and then the street uh, and by the way when I say street I mean the whole section here the whole road right of way including the sidewalks is now dominated by vehicles whereas before during ancient, ancient times it was dominated by people and like maybe a horse carriage so um, our public space becomes more and more inhospi uh, inhospitable to those who don't have cars. So it's really designed for people in vehicles. And who can, who has the resources to own vehicles? It's the middle to upper class. And this kind of sort of urban design is really kind of, um, I guess for lack of a better word, discriminatory against people who don't, who can't afford private vehicles. So this is why People like, let's see here, uh, Kevin Lynch, Siegfried Gridian started documenting kind of what, are, what are the elements of a city. So basically to understand what are the different problems and not so much that they wanted to go back to the Renaissance type of design, but they just, at this point, they just wanted to figure out what was going on. So Kevin Lynch was, the, I think, the most famous of uh, the 1940s architects and planners. He defined uh, the different elements of a city, the path, the edge, the district, the node, and the landmark. And then people like Jane Jacobs and um, what do you call this? American planners and eventually European. Uh, I think the European planners and designers uh, thought about public space first. And basically, um, the current trend now is to sort of reclaim the public domain by making things more uh, people friendly or uh, as you may have heard walkable more walkable cities and it also turns out that walkable cities are also more sustainable because um, as you may know uh, climate change etc all the negative effects of vehicles if we use vehicles less we have less co2 emissions therefore uh, walkable or kind of sustainable sustainable designs tend to favor non-motorized transportation and uh, really focus on people walking and also public transportation. So there's less um, private vehicles and there's more cycling, more walking, more buses, more trains. So that's where we are currently. So this is a sort of diagram for a mixed-use neighborhood 
well, I think this was first started around like 1920s, 1930s, and it became slowly, slowly becoming more and more popular. The problem is that uh, once you build a, uh, a city, it's very hard to like retrofit it or like change it into a newer form. You have to go incremental development, sort of what Camilio site was saying. Now, you can't just change a city overnight. You start with small projects and then eventually if those projects work it spreads out into other projects so what's going on in this diagram so the ideal sort of um, urban design today is to have a uh, dense i'll uh, just highlight here in red dense uh commercial and mixed use centers so commercial and residential here you also have a park over here where the building height can go up to like three, four stories, maybe even some high rise if you want. But um, the key feature here is that the radius or the size of a neighborhood unit is about four, is about uh, from here to here, let's say it's about 400 to 500 meters. So this is a neighborhood unit. So why 400 to 500 meters? is because in um, European and like uh, Caucasian countries, like uh, America, Canada, Europe, the 400 to 500 meters is the comfortable uh, length that their people can walk. So everywhere within the 400 to 500 meters is can be accessed by walking. So you don't have to use a car anymore. Uh, in contrast, if we go back here to Cebu, if we, I'll just highlight here, look at Fuente, the nearest residential area is something like this. Look at this one. Um, this group of houses here is about 300 or 400 meters, 300, 259, let's say 350 meters from Fuente Asmania Circle, that's next to the hospitals and the commercial buildings. And then you tend to see uh, it still holds true today, but the type of housing that's within a 400 to 300, um, 300 to 400 uh, meter distance from any sort of key destination is not really a high quality housing. For example, uh, let me showcase to you. All right, am I on red? I'll just switch to green here. So we have Fuente Osmeña Circle here. The nearest residential area are like informal settlements like this. And I think these are also houses over here. Uh, there's still, there's, yeah, there's, there's still houses, okay. So houses over here. And then I think that's pretty much it. You have like a big sort of low income population here. Really, again, enforcing that where there's like a work area, a hospital, where people can work or engage in economic activity, a residential area is not too far, but the quality of these residential areas are not very good, especially here in, uh, excuse me, beside Vicente Soto. And then if you look at this uh, map here, like around it, if I draw a 350 meter radius, there's no other residential area, like proper residential area, except for this one here. And that's because this area was built uh, around like 1920s, 1910, something like that, early 1900s. Where do the people who have the money live? So we zoom out. So something like this, you see some subdivisions already like down here. Measure distance, that's 700 meters. And then if you move further away, I'll just, it's, I think it's clear if I do it like this. Because you can really see the pattern of the subdivision development. Clear measurement, measure distance, like so. So these are the Kanang Woodcrest residences, the, the high end sort of uh, residential areas. Oops, sorry. And you can clearly see that these cities were built around not walking but vehicle uh private vehicle transportation is that you can see i'll highlight here in red these areas with the grids these were built uh before the car so you can see grids over here and you can see a bit of grids 
uh, down here in the heritage district. But the areas that don't have grids, these were built after the car, so after 1900s. I'll highlight it in blue. You can see these like squiggly roads here that kind of like lead to dead ends. So these are the high end subdivisions. This one could also be a subdivision back here, Sambag 2, and maybe here as well. And then in between that, I'll highlight it in, I guess I have to use green. These are the commercial areas here, commercial areas here, commercial areas, like hospitals, basically where people work. And then those who don't have a lot of money, who are forced to walk, uh, I'll just highlight it in, I'll customize here. Let's say pink lamp. Okay. So those who can't afford vehicles, they have to live close to where they work. They settle, oops, sorry. Customize pink, okay. They settle somewhere here, like near the near where the buildings are, the work areas are. So just like we saw in the map, I'll turn off. So you have Sambagwan, you have, uh, I think not much areas here on the Eastern side. They're more on the Western side of Fuente. You have some areas that look like this. So near Cogon Ramos, Sambagtu, Sambagwan. And then the affluent communities, those who can afford vehicles, live even further away. So I'll just color it with an aqua blue. So rich communities are here, about 700 or even like uh, 1,000 meters away. So it creates this, um, I guess, gap where affluent people or like people who want to live in better communities they move further away further away from where they work so they have because they can afford it and then they ride their private cars to get to work they're congesting the roads because like usually these types of people like uh, they own cars they don't carpool so it's just usually one person maybe two person uh, in a car so as the city grows, it spreads out even further and people who need to use the car because the city is designed around it, they go even further away. So this is what's happening. This is what we call as urban sprawl, which we'll be discussing in the coming weeks as well. So if you look at Cebu City, we identify like uh, the, like the, I guess, for lack of a better word, the high end housing. It's here in Kaning, this area here, Guadalupe. We have a bit more here in uh, La Hog, Banilad. So I'll just do a quick something like that. So let's say uh, how far is like Fuente to IT Park? That's about two kilometers. Then how far is the old heritage district from IT Park or the other affluent areas? Like three kilometers. And then going to, sorry, so many pop-ups. Should have, there. Apple one, but now at height, says about four kilometers away. So it's no longer kind of walkable. The, the minute you go, or the second you go more than 500 meters, people are more likely to use like uh, motorcycle, cars, and no longer is it viable for them to walk. So it ends up now. We're encouraging our citizens to live further away because we're not designing uh, compact neighborhoods in Cebu and also in Manila. So basically, I'll just highlight in red where people work. Here we have Fuente area. We have some parts here, Heritage District. We have Cebu IT Park. We have the Ayala area. Um, I think SM is somewhere here. and. USC is here. I think this is USC over here. And then where do people live? I'll just color it in blue. They live like in these areas here. Maybe also a bit IT park. And I think even more so there is a La Hug. So the affluent, the affluent sort of uh, housing, the high income housing is somewhere over here. And I think there's some high income housing I think he, here, here, 
basically the good neighborhoods quote unquote good neighborhoods the high income neighborhoods are about like more than uh two to three kilometers away from where they they work like for example we have um professionals who live in guadalupe but they work in the hospital down here in fuente there's other professionals who live all the way up here to Vanilla who need to travel down to uh, the Fuente area, especially doctors. That's where the hospitals are. And there's a lot of the high-end housing here, like Maria Luisa. We have uh, Maryville. Basically, the popular subdivisions are here in Vanilla. That's why the Vanilla Road is very congested during peak hours. There's a lot of people uh, who can afford cars need to go to where they work. And then it's very full now here in the vanilla rows. I'll just showcase that by turning on the traffic function. Like so, I already spent an hour on this. But this is sort of bleeding into our discussion next week, but just wanted to show the impacts of that. <clears throat> so I'll just switch this to typical traffic. Like so. So you can see this Talamba, this Talamban, uh, and uh, this road connecting Talamban, Banilad, and Fuente is fairly busy compared to these roads connecting Guadalupe to Fuente over here because it's a bit closer, easier to transport. And then the busiest roads are the roads that connect Cebu City to Talisay, Mandawe, and Lapu Lapu, especially the, this like Lapu Lapu bridge here. Because you have people who live in the Cebu city who go to Lapu Lapu to work and vice versa. So the uh, bridges get really con congested. The major highways get really congested like this. Um, I think um, some tra traffic is now being diverted to this like, coastal road. But you still feel it because there's just so many people. But anyway, that goes back to our discussion here where the current trend for urban design and urban planning, why they want to push walkability, why they want to push cycling is really to reduce the number or reduce the need for private vehicles. So if you have um, areas like this, I think the closest example would be IT Park, where you have a mixed use of like uh, working areas and living areas. But um, the problem now is where else can we do something like that? And then currently, uh, the government is eyeing the the Cebu City government is eyeing the uh, heritage district because there's a lot of underutilized uh, land like the Colon uh, the carbon market redevelopment plan the like heritage district plans uh, basically reusing this area because this is where there's a lot of land but it's not used properly no one is uh, visiting here and a lot of people tend to hang out or work and live around, uh, let me just highlight, like this. Tend to work and live around here. And notice that's where the roads are busiest. So that's the Ayala area, that's Park Mall, that's uh, near Fuente, the hospitals and the schools. So they're trying to make uh, this area here the heritage district something more attractive as well but you can see the traffic is a bit um uh, active but maybe it's just people coming and going and not really staying <laughs> okay so that's basically the overview of our kind of why we need urban design the history of urban design how we got here so let's uh move on to the uh next lecture so we have some videos over here um i think i can share this with you guys as well um just let me know if you want uh, more additional kind of introductions and basically summarize these videos into what we what we talked about today uh this quiz is just for my class because you guys thought those outside of my class can't access canvas we'll probably do something a bit more traditional at the end of this, maybe something with paper lang, and then you just take a picture of the paper and I'll have to manually check it <laughs> because uh, we're not all in the same canvas. Okay, so let me check my modules here. Uh, blah, 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 history of urban planning in uh, design in Cebu City. That was basically it. 
Uh, let's see. I need to go through this again. Okay. Uh, maybe just very quickly. So I'll just use these images. Open image in new tab. Just so you can have like a, the gist of what's going on. Okay. So as I mentioned before, so Cebu City started out here in our heritage district in the Colon area. And then by the 1900s, almost like uh, 300 years later, we have something like this now. And also that we also have the um, railway. I think it was uh, opened around early 1900s. Manila had theirs, I think, the late 1800s, like 1890 or something like that. And then you can see it's still kanang very much regulated. You see, you still see the grid pattern here. But then after World World War II and the popular the the popular is it popularization of the private automobile, you have these roads that spread inland uh, into the sort of the mountains area mountainous areas, and then you have some sort of regulate uh, some sort of kanang regulating body present during the 1970s we have the anang, the government is still able to control development but then during the sort of peak or the economic boom of the 80s and 90s uh basically government said if you have the money you can build whatever you want so let the market decide how it wants to build and then this is how we ended up with a city that looks like this so it was developers are uh, rich developers rich families um wealthy sort of groups bought the land and created more subdivisions basically copied the urban sprawl development of the u.s which was good for the economy uh in the short term but in the long term we're now feeling the uh negative effects like uh, traffic congestion not enough housing a lot of kind of uh, land is used by the upper to middle class while very very small plots of land are allocated to the informal uh not really allocated to but are left for the low income basically the workers of cebu city they have very small plots of land so they have to like settle for kanang shack housing mga squatter areas and squatter areas develop because this type of um planning leaves a lot of gaps in between like uh, large residential communities and commercial areas and because the the uh, the attractiveness of coming to Cebu and finding a job is more is very powerful than just staying in the rural areas like some mga, um, western and even northern parts of Cebu province they still come here to Cebu city and then because they can't afford the um, the housing they're forced to squat or they look for kind of um, cheaper houses or cheaper rooms. And that creates like a cycle where um, I'm sure you've heard it before. The rich get richer, more land gets allocated to the upper, the upper class. And then they eat uh, existing land that's supposed to be provided for the working class. But um, basically they're forcing the working class away or uh, make it difficult for them to have proper housing so the working class is forced to stay in this uh, informal settlements squatting er squatting areas and then it just creates this uh, gap between um, two kinds of citizens the the rich and the poor so the rich get richer and the poor get worse it's not very sustainable as you can see and we're already feeling the negative effects in sort of more developed countries the gap between rich and poor isn't so big, but it's still there. But this is how urban design and urban planning can sort of help with the um, poverty situation is by creating and identifying new, new areas for mixed use developments and affordable housing. So we, we will scale back our kind of urban sprawl here and then we're sort of refocus, shifting back to our kind of more compact more kind of uh, walkable and um, sustainable urban design so that's basically the the thrust of this kind of module and then 
Um, I think I've discussed it in some of my classes before. Um, in the 2000s and 90s as well, we've had plans like um, the Metro Cebu Land Use uh, and Transportation Plan, Metro Cebu Land Use and Transportation, yeah, MCLUTS, M-C-L-U-T-S. And our even USC in, uh, participated in local planning um, with the Green Loop, basically a road or a network of uh, roads that will create a loop around Cebu City, Lapu-Lapu City, and Mandawe City. And it will function both as like a tourist attraction and also as a green buffer to sort of absorb the pollution and also provide some kind of um, breathing room for the three Kanang cities. So let me just show that here. All right, here we go. So the idea in the 2000s, this is more urban planning than urban design, was really decentralization. So because Cebu City, Lapu-Lapu, and uh, Mandawe are getting very populated, the idea was to spread out development so that we don't encroach on our kind of mountain areas. And the issue with building upon our mountain areas over here, let me just highlight it, is that this area is very kind of, the slope is very high and the soil is not as strong. So if we develop further here into our mountains, we, are, we run the risk of landslides and also we decrease our, or we damage our kind of, um what they call this aquifers uh, or like our water supply here we have some dams up here and then if we have too much development over here it may not be able to absorb as much water and that's exactly what happened in the past 20 years developments went beyond this sort of um, proposed urban limit and now we experience a lot of flooding in these areas here like uh, this is the, uh, what's it? our mountainous areas, if you remember, oh wait, you weren't around, but uh, Talamban, uh, the Talamban campus, uh, USC, had a lot of problems with flooding. The Guadalupe area here has a lot of problems with flooding. And then I can even show you a map of that later on. So the idea of the green loop as well is to sort of create more kind of, um, more spaces for people to gather, but also include uh, trees, vegetation to absorb rainwater, so to help with the, the flooding and other negative environmental impacts. So if you see here, we have the Trade and Financial Center. This is the Ayala Business Park. You have the Cultural District, which is the Colon area. I don't know what MICE is, M-I-C. I think it's Mandawe something, like commercial area. The creative design and manufacturing hub this is where um this is near the usc you can see here kanang i think also what is this area here i think i'll zoom out a bit this is that area there Let's see looks like the kabangkalan area no? i think they're highlighting the schools the schools and the um sort of education district. So that's why they call it Creative Design and Manufacturing Hub. Housing here in, this is going to, oh, sorry, so many tabs. Let me close the traffic. Okay, going to Consolacion, oops. And then to the south, we have uh, going to Talisay Metalworks and Manufacturing the commercial centers in the south road properties housing here in um uh, next to the the colon area so this is kind of like the um I forget the name yeah labangon area pase labangon kalamba sort of to support the cultural and heritage district and then of course in lapu lapu we have the tourism zone which uh, i think it's getting a bit uh has been getting a bit out of control lately because like they're fencing off beaches it doesn't look as good as it did like 20 years ago 
So um, <clears throat> this is the general plan that the University of San Carlos proposed together with, um, this was proposed by uh, USC led by, I think it was Joseph, uh, Joseph Michael Espina, or what our for, we call we call him uh, Sir Yumi, <laughs> former dean of uh, the School of Architecture and Fine Arts. Uh, I think they're pushing through with this. In fact, if you see here, the third bridge was part of that proposal. This was way back 2000s, pa, 20 almost like yeah, 20 years ago, and then they built the bridge recently, the CCLX. So I think the government is like going through with this. Okay, so that's basically an overview of uh, urban design. Now we can finally get to 38, 30, 9.30, until 12, so we still have some time. Okay, so I think it will be a good time to do a short check up here. How do we submit it? Mm -hmm. How do we do the submission? Uh, I guess we'll do Google Classroom. Let's go to Classroom. Let's close these. Okay. Oh, how many are you there? There are 82. Oh my gosh. Ah, uh, yes, question. Uh, yeah, for those in York, for those in my class, but um, there, I don't know how to quiz those people who are not in my canvas because this is just our class here. Or th did um, Miss Donna give you a quiz as well? One, two, three. Okay, in my canvas, there's only forty-five people, and in the, and in, in the Google Meet today, there are eighty-two. So there's like 40 students now on the activity. Ah, now my activity. Ah, okay. Let's see that. Okay. Uh, I'll stop recording here because we're transitioning to our next lecture.